Hi, I'm Aaron from Living Science Videos. You know those stories you hear about artists never being appreciated during their lifetime? Like the great poet and fiction writer Edgar Allan Poe. At the ripe old age of 40, that's my age minus your age, a stranger found Poe babbling incoherently. He couldn't even explain why he was face down in a gutter and wearing someone else's clothes. He died without ever regaining his right state of mind, shouting about some guy named Reynolds. He never knew that his poems, like The Raven, would later become classics all around the world because he didn't become famous until some time after he died. His contemporary, though they didn't know each other, Gregor Mendel didn't have it quite that bad. He was born a decade after Poe in 1822 in what is now the Czech Republic. He was very different from Poe, and perhaps this is why he didn't end his life wearing somebody else's clothes in a gutter. Mendel was born to parents who had a small farm but had to sacrifice so that he could be educated. At 18, he was accepted into a university and studied physics, mathematics, and philosophy. He struggled so much financially that his professors suggested that he join a monastery at Abbey of St. Thomas in Brune in 1843. So unlike Poe, it was the sober life for Mendel. And then again, like Poe, Mendel would eventually be famous, yet never know it. If Mendel had a stroke of good fortune, it was that the Abbey of St. Thomas had a reputation for its study of the sciences. The director had an avid interest in the traits of domesticated animals and plants. Mendel also had use of the Abbey's five-acre garden. And what did he use the garden for? Pea plants. Lots and lots of pea plants. At this point in the story, we're going to talk about what he discovered with those pea plants. Lots and lots of pea plants, tens of thousands of them over several generations. Uh, no, I'm not going to say lots and lots of pea plants every time we mention pea plants in the video because there will be too many times after this and it will get really old. You see, Mendel was curious about why some pea plants were tall and others short. Also, why some pea plant flowers were purple and others white. He even observed that some pea plant seeds were wrinkled and others round. Each of these specific characteristics, like tallness or shortness, is called a trait. I bet you thought I was going to say pea plant again. You see, Mendel wasn't satisfied with the most popular hypothesis of the day that explained how traits were passed from parents to offspring. His predecessor in the study of heredity, or the inheritance of ancestral traits, was Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. Lamarck's hypothesis was that individuals could acquire traits during their lifetime from their activities or their environment and pass those traits on to their offspring. For example, he explained that the length of a giraffe's neck was acquired from parent giraffes stretching their necks to reach leaves and that they'd stretched them so much over many generations that their kids were born with longer necks. Back then, people actually believed that if you worked out with weights every day and built yourself up from a weakling, that your kids would be born stronger than you were born. Of course, that doesn't make any sense to us anymore. We know it doesn't really work like that. But back then, it, that idea was very popular with those who liked to believe that the power of personal ambition could enhance every aspect of your being, including how smart or strong your children were, even at birth. So when Darwin proposed a more accurate explanation, a lot of people didn't like it, because it didn't matter how much you believed in yourself. Your children didn't inherit that. Darwin's theory also had a critical flaw in it at that time. He was missing a key element. He knew that there had to be units of information inherited from both mother and father, but he couldn't work out what that was or how it worked, and his theory depends on that. Scientists have since discovered that physical expression of some traits can be altered by the parent's environment, but not the way Lamarck imagined. Genetics is the scientific study of heredity, like the blend of DNA you inherited from your parents. DNA is in long strands that are tightly coiled and packed into chromosomes. There are different sections of this bit of string which control what traits you can have, and we call those sections of DNA genes. There are many genes in each of your chromosomes. The modern study of genetics also includes epigenetics, the study of how genes are expressed. Your genetic structure is your genotype, but how those genes are expressed, meaning what observable effects they have, are phenotypes. One laboratory example of epigenetics is the agouti gene in mice, which causes them to overeat and have a yellow coat. Without changing the genotype, scientists were able to stop the physical expression of the phenotype of the agouti gene by simply changing the mother's diet to foods high in methyl, like garlic. So back to the pea plants, because most of this video is about pea plants and not lots and lots of plumped up mice or stretched out giraffes. Heredity doesn't work the way that Darwin thought it did, and it's not quite as simple as Lamarck envisioned it either. Look at this picture of the traits of pea plants. 
As you can see, each gene for a trait has different characteristics. For example, the gene for flower color has a purple trait and a white one. The different forms of a gene are called alleles. So this pea plant has an allele for purple flowers and an allele for white flowers. But which one gets to be the phenotype, the observable effect of that gene? The simplest way to predict the offspring of pea plants are pea plants that are purebred. A purebred organism is a strain that for several generations has shown only one form of a trait. Like several generations of purple plants, all have the genotype of a single trait of the purple allele. Because the genotype has only one form of the trait, it's called homozygous. Where it starts to get a little more complicated to predict the physical expression of a gene is when the genotype is heterozygous, or different forms of the gene are inherited. Like a pea plant that has the alleles for both white and purple flowers. Which allele gets expressed, the purple one or the white one? Mendel developed a clever way to fertilize pea plants by using a brush to carry along the process. He crossed tall pea plants with short pea plants. The parent generation is now noted with the symbol P1. P stands for parent, and the offspring are called F1. The F stands for filial, which in Latin pertains to daughters and sons. When he crossed the plants, he noticed that the F1 generation were tall. He discovered that the gene for tallness was a dominant allele. In other words, that trait appears when the allele is present. Then he allowed the next F2 generation to pollinate on its own, and to his surprise, three quarters were tall and one quarter short. Shortness in pea plants is a recessive allele, meaning that it doesn't express itself if a dominant allele is present. Some of the pea plants had to be hybrid, a blend of both the tall and short allele. Here to break that down with a Punnett square is micro raw. The Punnett square is a diagram used for determining the probability of different outcomes in genetics. The top and left part of the diagram represent two parents with two genes each. Let's say that said genes are black fur and white fur. Black fur is represented by a capital B, and white fur is represented by a lowercase b. Capital letters representing genes means that the genes are dominant. That means if any organism has that gene, the gene will show. A lowercase letter means that it's recessive, which means that it will only show if only that gene exists. For example, if a kitten has both a black fur and a white fur gene, or only black fur genes, she'll have black fur. If she has both white fur genes, she'll have white fur. The Punnett square models the situation to make it easy to understand. Each box is a possible child of the parents, with the top and left genes of their box simulating inheriting the genes from their parents. Mendel had stumbled, albeit methodically, upon what is now known as the scientific field of genetics. He was excited to publish his paper on pea plant genetics in 1865, but just like Poe, he was ahead of his time and few understood his genius. Perhaps he understood the implications of what he found and how monumental it was because he reportedly said to a colleague, my time will come. He died in 1884 at 61 years old in relative obscurity. Many of his papers were burnt by the next abbot at the monastery. He was nursing some grudge about an unrelated matter. Mendel's time didn't come until 40 years later when other scientists began to notice that they were all citing his work. They realized that Mendel had discovered the answer to Darwin's dilemma. The blend of heritable traits of information that Darwin suggested would not have allowed recessive traits to be dormant in one generation to be expressed in the next. And natural selection didn't really work without that. So Darwin's theory was consequently eclipsed by Lamarckism until Mendel's discovery showed how Darwin's theory really worked. Now evolutionary theory is no longer referred to as Darwinism, but the modern Mendelo-Darwinian synthesis of natural selection and genetics. Although Gregor Mendel received little recognition in life, he is today revered by scientists as the father of genetics, all because of the humble pea plant. I had to say that one more time. Do you know that scientists are recreating extinct dinosaurs? That's right, you might have a velociraptor in no time, but hold your Parasaurolophus, champ. This thing is not a velociraptor. Velociraptor actually looked more like this. They were essentially ground-based eagles. They use their wings for things other than flight, like raptor prey restraint, where they knock over their prey, stand on top of it, and flap their wings to balance and eat their prey alive. This is what golden eagles do. That's why scientists are re reactivating genes in modern birds like chickens to create the great creatures that once ruled the earth, from the massive Dakota raptor to possibly the even more massive bird, Tyrannosaurus. Using the genes of modern birds like cassowaries and using a few genes from animals like alligators for teeth enamel, we have already been able to create bird embryos with snouts. We are getting close to unfusing the wing fingers, and that's just what they're working on right now. Think of the possibilities. Mm -hmm.